Uh, Happy New Year. Happy New Year. And uh, Merry Christmas again. Merry Christmas. Because it's still Christmas time. Yes. How many days are in Christmas? Well, there we go. Just remember the song. Um, most people have no idea why they sing the 12 days of Christmas because most people don't celebrate 12 days of Christmas. But we do things the right way here. Uh, <laughs> just kidding. Um, but um, as I say that, I am reminded that we are actually coming up towards the end of the Christmas season. Uh, the season officially ends at Epiphany, also called Three Kings Day. Um, and this will be the last Sunday during the season of Christmas. And interestingly enough, this particular Sunday coincides with another important day in the church calendar. It's called the Sunday of the Holy Name of Jesus. It's also called uh, the Circumcision of Our Lord. But these days we mostly just call it the Holy Name of Jesus. Um, and this is a day in the church where we celebrate the circumcision of Jesus and his naming at the temple. Because this is the time when Jesus' name is actually officially declared. So before that, parents don't, didn't back then just name the child when they were born. They went through a whole ritual process, and then after the child was circumcised, the child was given a name, and that was the name given to Jesus. To uh, the, the child was Jesus. Um, and it has become, I think, probably the most famous name in the world. Is there any name more famous than Jesus's? It is the name above all names because it's the name of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords and the Prince of Peace. It is the most blessed name uh, of any time, of any person, and of any place, and that is part of why we commemorate it. So, I'm going to take us back a little bit here. Do y'all remember a couple of Sundays ago uh, when we discussed the two names given to the Christ child in the Gospels? Uh, they were Emmanuel and Jesus. Emmanuel meaning God is with us. Jesus meaning God is salvation. So Christmas Day and Christmas Eve, if you wanted to pair these together, are really about celebrating that first part, Emmanuel, God is with us. Because they're about celebrating the Incarnation. Uh, when we celebrate the holy name of Jesus, this is kind of the day we set aside for the other name that's given to the child and the meaning of the name, which is now that God is with us, good question, uh, what is God doing? God is bringing salvation. Therefore, the child is named Jesus, and he is the light of the world. Jesus, a wonderful, wonderful child. The lesson we get today from the Gospel of Luke begins in such an interesting way. It begins by saying, when the angels had left them and gone into heaven. See, this is kind of a little bit of where we are right now. The big major stuff has happened. The birth has happened. The revelations have all happened. The dreams have already happened. And now the angels have left us. They've left the shepherds and gone back into heaven. So if you all see what the gospel writer Luke here is doing, is he's beginning the section of this story kind of bringing us back down to the ground a little bit. Making the story a little bit more gritty, a little bit more human, a little bit less theatrical, if you wanted to put it that way. But there's a reason why at this point the angels have left and gone back to heaven. Because an angel is not a god. An angel is a messenger for God. And they appear to tell us things on God's behalf. Angels are the voice of heaven. But now, we don't need the angels anymore. You see, the, the heavens opened up and they spoke to the shepherds. And they pointed the shepherds in another direction. They pointed them away from the angels. They pointed them to the manger. Where Mary is treasuring things and pondering them in her heart. Where Joseph is looking lovingly on his wife and on the child she has just given birth to. The shepherds come, they rejoice in everything that they have seen. And the angels have gone back to heaven because we don't need them anymore. Because heaven has come to earth. Heaven has come to earth. Because in Christ we see the human and the divine together. Up until now in scripture, heaven has been speaking with a voice from on high to show people where to go. But now, the voice from heaven does not come from an angel. It doesn't come from on high. It doesn't come from the still, small voice in the whirlwind like it did with the prophet Elijah. 
The voice from heaven doesn't come from just the whirlwind and the thundering voice as it did in the book of Job. Now, the voice of heaven does not come singing from the heavenly hosts or the chorus beyond the clouds. Now the heavenly voice of heaven is in a child, in a manger. If you want to look for the voice of God now, you don't look up. Where do you look? Down. Down in Mary's lap. Down beneath Joseph's gauge. Down close to the ground, not even in a house. That is where the voice of heaven is. Now the voice of heaven is giggling in his mother's lap. Now the voice of heaven is common and as near to us as anything has ever been. And the fact that God is with us now means that God has saved us. And it began with this small voice. And it means God will keep saving us forever and ever and ever. You see, we, like the shepherds, have to go where heaven tells us to go. And we ought to be like Joseph and stand by people and stand with people who are in need of our help. And we all need to be like Mary and just be willing to go with the flow and treasure words in our hearts and ponder them rather than getting all worked up about it and going berserk like a lot of people seem to be doing. Which, to their credit, if I saw an angel, I'd probably get a little excited about it too. Because we see, we're coming to the end of the Christmas season and the start of the new one, the epiphany, the light of God shining on us and coming up, bubbling up through us. And this is a time of year that makes me think of a quote from a very famous theologian named Howard Thurman. Anybody here ever heard of Howard Thurman? Yeah. Uh, he passed away in 1981. And that was six years before I was born. Uh, he was the dean of the chapel at Howard University, and he was the dean of the chapel at Boston University. And he's one of the greatest theologians that the United States and perhaps even the entire Christian tradition has ever produced, and he wasn't even Episcopalian. Wow. <laughs> he was an African American who absolutely refused to whitewash his Jesus and his gospel. He was a minister. And he was a preacher who always called people to account before the great light of the gospel because he understood that the voice of God now speaks from down low. And I always think of him around this time of year because he writes of the end of the Christmas season, the last Sunday of Christmas, the start of Epiphany. He says this, when the song of the angels is stilled, when the star in the sky is gone, when the kings and princes are home, when the shepherds are back with their flock, the work of Christmas begins. To find the lost, to heal the broken, to feed the hungry, to release the prisoner, to rebuild nations, to bring peace among people, to take music in the heart. And so as we bring Christmas to a close and embark on the feast of the, epi of the epiphany, which is coming soon, and we celebrate the name of Jesus, which is God saving us, we have to remember to carry all of this on, keep it, ponder it, treasure it in your heart. All the way through Epiphany, all the way through Lent, all the way through Holy Week and Pentecost and ordinary time, let us always keep the work of Christmas with us. That work to find the lost and heal the broken, to feed the hungry and release the prisoner, to rebuild communities that are broken and fractured and be agents of peace in a world of violence. And let us never, ever, ever forget that the work of the gospel is the work of joy. And as Mr. Thurman said, we ought to do it all with music in our hearts, Amen. living life and living it abundantly. Amen. May this be your new year. Amen. Amen.